Let's have a serious talk about ransomware and your backups. And I don't mean to make you feel bad, but you're probably doing it wrong. So we need to take a look at how backups can save you from a ransomware attack. You can either protect your data using on-premise backup, or you can do it using the cloud. And we're going to talk about the differences between those, but first let's talk about ransomware itself. So what is ransomware? Well, it is, first off, an over $1 trillion a year type of attack. And what ransomware attackers do is, once they get inside your network, and they can do that a lot of different ways, then they charge you to get your data back by giving you a key to decrypt the data that they have encrypted on your server or your computers. Now, I could get into how they do this, how they go about it, but I think what's important in this video is to talk about backups, because backups can save you from a ransomware attack. And a lot of people are just not backing up their data properly. So we're going to talk about cloud backups, third-party backups, Windows Server backup, all those different types of products out there. Ransomware has hit a lot of large organizations, such as financial institutions, hospitals, and governments. However, it's now time to focus on some of the smaller organizations, and that's what the ransomware attackers have done. And that's because the larger organizations have now protected themselves. So what they're doing is they're going after small governments, small businesses, charitable organizations, uh, anywhere where a data is kept and available online. That $1 trillion a year plus in ransomware is a really big number, and that's because more than half the countries in the world don't even produce a trillion dollars in their gross domestic product. So the government came up with HIPAA and Sarbanes-Oxley, things that you're supposed to be doing, but unfortunately a lot of governments and institutions that are holding our data are not doing anything about it, or they're attempting to do things about it, but they're trying to spend as little money as possible, and that's coming back to bite them. Now the average ransomware attack used to just uh, require a $1,500 payoff. Now the average attack is $43,000 for the payoff. So the attacks are becoming more expensive, and and they're attacking smaller organizations, which is a much more difficult for smaller organizations to be able to pay off. Now, in my opinion, paying off ransomware should be illegal, and I've written an article about that on LinkedIn. And uh, that's because uh, once you make something illegal to pay off, yeah, you're going to have a few people that get hacked that won't get their data back. You'll see some people get fired. Some bad things will happen for about a week or two. And then after that, the hackers will no longer go after anybody in our country because they won't pay them off. It'll be illegal to pay them off. So you can eliminate 99% of all hacks. So you have to ask yourself, why is this not illegal? So either our leaders are inept or they're getting paid off somehow. So I don't, either one is not a good thing, but uh, it should be made illegal and it should be made illegal right away. If you have data on premise, so you have it inside your organization, whether it's in a server room in your business or maybe it's in a, a, a cage in a data center. So it's still considered on premise, uh, even though it may be in what you might call a private cloud because it's still local to where you are geographically. And that data needs to be backed up where it is. So you've got to have on-premise backup. Unfortunately, a lot of people are moving to cloud backups exclusively. And that is a big mistake. And I'll tell you why. If you've ever done a full backup of, let's say, terabytes of information, then it's always days or weeks behind live data. And that's because we're pushing that data up at a very slow rate. Uh, maybe we're pushing it up at 10 megabits per second, 20, even 100 megabits per second is not enough to push up terabytes of data every night. Now, if you're running uh, on-premise backup, you can either back that up at a gigabit or even 10 gigabits per second. And that's going to be uh, much more effective for having backups available from data as live as possible after a ransomware attack. Now, the other problem with cloud backup is that it's really expensive. It costs way more than if you had your backup on premise. And backups don't always do what's called a bare metal restore. So if you, if you have hardware that dies and you're trying to restore that data, then when you do the cloud backup, if they don't do the bare metal restore option, you're going to be missing things such as SQL data, exchange email data, active directory, uh, system state information, all different kinds of information that you need to restore. And most cloud backups don't back up that data. They just 
backup files. And if the file is in use and you don't have volume shadow turned on, you don't even get those backups done. So uh, a lot of people are paying a huge amount of money for cloud backup that isn't even backing up all of their data. There are many great products out there for backing up your data on premise, uh, such as starting with the Windows Server Backup. Now, you can only back up one server, the server that you're on with Windows Backup, but it's a very good uh, backup option. It's free, so if you have one or two servers, it's perfect. You just set a backup on each one, and you rotate those drives offline or off-site. So that way, if you do end up getting attacked with ransomware, then there's no way that those were affected. Now, one thing a lot of people are doing wrong with Windows Server Backup is that they're backing it up on a schedule and rotating these drives. So that's not the wrong part. The wrong part is that uh, the first time you do a Windows backup, it backups the entire server. It'll do a bare metal backup, which means you can do a bare metal restore to a new server. But after that, it just does incremental backups. So you may only have one full backup on one drive and no full backups on the other drive, so you'll never be able to do a full restore. So you'll have to do a full backup on each drive after you bring it back in from rotation. And that could mean some additional manual uh, settings that you'll have to do. It's not gonna be as automated, but it's the only way to do it right. There is a lot of great third-party backups out there. Now, according to datanize.com, uh, Veritas uh, Backup Exec and NetBackup hold about 25% of the market. Uh, after that, you've got Commvault, which is about 9%, and then you've got Veeam, which is about just under 7%. And uh, the other 60% or so of all of the other backups are being used by a whole bunch of different companies. So besides Backup Exec or Veritas, there really is no uh, consensus on what backup product we should be using. So I'm not going to really get into you know, what each individual backup product can do, but I can tell you what each backup product should do. So one of the things it should do is obviously the full backups, which they all do, incremental backups, which they all do. Uh, they should also give you the option for differential backups. Now, I've done some videos on the difference between those two. You can check out if you want to know the difference between the two. You should also be able to restore to a virtual machine. So that means that if your hardware has gone dead on a server, you need to restore that server, but you don't have more hardware, you should be able to convert that backup to a virtual machine, whether VMware or Hyper-V. So uh, uh, that should be definitely a thing that it has. It should also have the option for cloud backup, so that way you can uh, you just use that one single product to back up locally as well as in the cloud if you decide that that's what you want to do. Now using that type of product will give you that bare metal restore. But if you use a product that is simply cloud backup by itself, those typically don't give you the bare metal restore. However, keep in mind, cloud backup is going to be days or weeks behind your on-premise backup. So even if you decide to do it and pay all that extra money, then it doesn't mean that it's going to be up to date. That's why you got to have on-premise. So how do we do on-premise backup correctly? Well, the, there's so much data now. We now have terabytes and terabytes of data. And we, what we used to do is we used to do a full backup on a Friday night, and by Monday, that backup job would be done. And then we could do an incremental backup uh, Monday through Thursday, and then we would do the full backup again on Friday. We can't do that anymore because we have too much data. And that's because hard drives have become very cheap. There was a time when hard drives were expensive, so uh, we wouldn't save that much data. But now it's so cheap, but it's become more and more expensive to backup it up. So first thing is you can check to see when the last time a file has been used by going to its properties or the properties of the folder for many files. And I would suggest strongly that you move anything that hasn't been used within two years off to a Blu-ray backup disk, which you can then take completely offline. It'll never be encrypted. It'll always be available. You could use DVDs as well, but Blu-ray is going to hold a lot more data, so you don't need quite as many. Next thing you want to do is you don't want to do the traditional backup to a backup disk alone. What you want to do is you want to back up to an iSCSI SAN storage area network or a very high end like either a QLogic or a QNAP uh, uh, backup NAS device that you can attach using multiple network cards. And then what you do is once you back it all up to that full device, then you take another, a second SAN or uh, NAS device and you put it in another location. Maybe you've got uh, a separate office, maybe you've got a data center that you have locally, uh, or maybe even you have high-speed connection at, at, at somebody's home that's a, uh, an owner of the company. Doesn't matter. You make a copy of that data 
to the other location. So that way you have two geographic locations. And the third thing you want to do is to make copies of that copy that would be offline. So the first two copies are going to be online. The one that's local, the one that's remote, those are online copies. But then that third one is going to be a copy that is offline once it's done copying. So you're going to always have three copies of data. Now, if you want that third copy, it could be cloud backup if you don't mind paying the extra money and having it weeks behind, but I don't recommend that you do that. I recommend that you do all that uh, copying fairly close to where you physically are. And you're going to find that all third-party, really good backup software uh, products out there are going to do just that. They can make copies, and they can make copies of copies. Uh, and they know that you should be doing this because it can protect you from ransomware and a lot of other disasters. Now, as far as where you back up the data to, obviously, you're going to have to have a server that does the backup, right? So you have either a Windows server, a Linux server, whatever it is that you decide. Now, if you're in a Windows Active Directory environment, which almost everybody is, and you have if your Windows server is your backup server, which almost everybody does if you do it on premise, then uh, well, a lot of the a lot of people make the mistake of having that backup server on the same domain as your working Active Directory domain in Forest. Don't do that. What you want to do is you can do one of two things: you can either put that server into a work group and have a completely different username and password, or for even better security have that server be in its own separate domain in Forest. So it's called a Bastion domain. And what it does is it has its own complete separate security setup from your working domain. However, it can still back up data from your working domain because Backup Exec gives you the ability to put in a username and password for a different domain for the backups. So let's say, for instance, that your entire Active Directory domain and all of your data gets encrypted. Well, all the data in the Bastion domain is being is completely a, a different username and password, which is not compromised because no one is on that Bastion domain other than the administrator for that domain. So there are no users, there are there is no staff that's on that domain. And that will keep your data separate and safe. Now, if you're an executive watching this rather than an IT administrator, uh, what I strongly suggest from experience is that you walk over to your IT administrator and you make them, right in front of you, do a file restore if they're doing either cloud or on-premise backup. And that's because a lot of times what they'll do is they'll check the uh, backup logs or they'll get an email saying everything is good, but in reality, uh, you're going to find out there's no data on there. And that's because sometimes the logs lie and they say everything is fine and it's really not. So you do have to do test restores and a lot of IT administrators don't do those. So make them do one for you just to make sure the data is actually there. Now, what if all your data is online or most of it's online? Uh, should you back it up? Well, uh, if you use, say, Microsoft Azure, for instance, uh, they've just signed a deal with Veeam which allows you to back up your data in the cloud. So your servers are in the cloud and your backup is in the cloud. And that's fine. It does cost a lot extra, but it's certainly a good way to ensure that your data is there. Another way to do this is to pay extra for that cloud data to be in multiple regions. So you can say, hey, I'm in the West. However, I would like to have geographically another copy of this, uh, either in the Midwest or in the East Coast. And so that way, or even out of the country if you want, that way if for some reason I have an earthquake or, or something else happens, uh, then my data will be in a completely different area where I can then you know, use that data uh, or restore to it. So using the different regions of the country, or if you're in another country, using the, uh, the different regions that they have there will definitely help you in case you have a natural disaster or a uh, ransomware that takes down your network. You'll then have another copy. Now, interestingly enough, Microsoft doesn't back up, for instance, their Microsoft Exchange servers. They, they don't do it. So what they do is they have what's called lagged copies. And you can do this too. You can have a lagged copy uh, where uh, basically what happens is uh, you have your exchange database and then that's live and then you have another database where it's an hour behind, a day behind or a week behind, whatever it is that you want. So that way if you get attacked, you have up until the lagged copy time expires before 
that database will also become corrupted. And you also have the ability to restore emails. So if somebody went in and deleted a whole bunch of emails and you want to get those emails back, you can go to the lag copy and get all those emails back. So that's an interesting uh, thing that Microsoft is doing. They're not backing up their email. They're just having copies that are a little bit behind. So why do accountants love cloud servers and cloud backup? Well, it's because uh, the bean counters in your organization love to have the expenses all be the same every month. They can budget for that. So if, for, if you use uh, cloud backup and it costs four times more than on-premise backup, but it always costs the same every month, then the bean counter can then uh, a budget for that every month and every year, and there's no uh, issues for them. They love that. They don't care that it costs more. They don't have a big picture mentality. Uh, they think they do, but I've worked with enough of them. I can tell you they don't. So uh, you just want to make sure that uh, they understand that it's definitely going to cost more to do that. What you could do is say, hey, how about you give me the budget that this would have cost, and um, I'll use it to replace my backup hardware and software as it goes bad, and I'll give anything back that I don't spend. That might actually speak to them, and they may end up doing that so you're not forced to use the cloud backup. Same thing with cloud servers. Uh, we did some tests and uh, installed some uh, Hyper-V servers on Azure, barely used them, and they cost over $500 a month. Uh, that's $6,000 a year for a server that probably would have only cost three. So basically, you're paying for the cost of two servers, uh, you know, every year for you know cheap servers. If I would have thoroughly used that Hyper-V server, it might have been a thousand dollars a month, which would have equated to say maybe a six to eight thousand dollars server. Uh, so you're you're definitely paying a lot more for cloud servers. It makes a lot more sense to have your equipment on site and then maybe uh, do a replication off to a data center where you have a second set of servers. They will pay for themselves within one year. So it's, it's uh, way smarter to do it that way than to have all of your data up in the cloud where you have no control over it, and if the internet goes down, you'll lose access to it. So uh, it's, it's definitely better to uh, have your equipment on premise uh, if you can uh, talk your people into it. So the bottom line is you need to double or triple the amount of backups you do and the budget for which you do it. And that will definitely keep you safe from any type of ransomware attack. So from the ransomware attacks that I have seen and been a part of over the years, we only had a couple of times where we had to pay money for it. And that was very early on in the entire ransomware uh, you know, phenomenon. And that was because at that time we didn't really understand uh, what was happening. I even went to uh, an ESET antivirus convention and that particular year, which was uh, probably going back seven, eight years. And I said, hey, how come you haven't talked about ransomware? And they said, oh, well, it's not really that big a deal. But uh, the next year, everybody got hit with it. And of course, all they talked about was ransomware You know, that time. So in the beginning, we were all a little bit naive about what they could do and, and how they could get to us. But since that time, uh, I've deployed those types of uh, protections for my customers, and we haven't had to pay any ransomware off since because we always had off-site, up-to-date copies that were uh, available to us right away, and we could do bare metal restoration. So I definitely uh, strongly suggest that you follow this advice so you don't end up having to pay $43,000 for your next attack. And uh, if you are a hospital, a financial institution, or a government, and you have my data on your servers, you sure better well ha have that stuff protected because that would make me very unhappy to have you have all that stuff out there and say, we don't have the budget in order to protect it because that would be against the law and would be a crime. And I suggest you don't do it. So spend more money now so you don't have to give it to Putin or Z or Kim Jong-il in the near future.